Hello everyone, this is part three of Uncommon Conversations, episode 17, with Bo Hopkins, the power lifter and businessman out of Texas. Um, I just had a package come to the door, just standard mail, but uh, the, the knock on the door was was pretty intense, so um, I felt I thought it was more serious than it was. Um, <clears throat> all right. All right. Hello. Back. All right. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, it was just a package coming here. I, I'm in a, a little 24 unit apartment building. Gotcha. And um, they will bring our mail to our door if it's a package and stuff. And so the knock was so heavy, I was like, sounds serious, but it was, it was just a package. So, yeah. Anyway, so what were we talking about? I'm sorry, I lost lost track. Uh, we're talking about uh, Obama and everything he said, and then absolutely nothing oh. came to fruition. And we were talking about health care. Health care, health care. Yeah, so what, what changes did you see in terms of, um, like, reductions in, dedu in um, deductions and insurance, you know, premiums and stuff like that? So access. It did, yeah, it did get more expensive. So I used to be able to get my family on five kids, you know, wife and me. We would get on for about nine hundred and fifty bucks a month. And then it jumped all the way up to about fourteen hundred and fifty bucks a month. But with that fourteen hundred and fifty dollars a month, instead of having a three thousand dollar deductible, we had a fifteen thousand dollar deductible. Um, so it was just you know, it was almost you know, I mean it was good to have it, but it was, you know, you never met your deductible, <laughs> you know, so it was, so just, it was out of pocket. Yeah. Everything was just out of pocket really. Now they did have some copay stuff. Um, but, uh, not great copay, you know, usually I'd be, you'd get medications for five, 10 bucks, but then the copays were now 50. So, so it was just, it, everything was just more expensive. And then all the employees, we, we offered that to them, but they couldn't afford it. And so we had to find lesser barrier entry plans that were just garbage. They were just straight up garbage, honestly. And uh, so we started subsidizing them, you know, as most, as most we could to be able so they could at least, you know, try to afford themselves to get good insurance. But it was just really difficult. So I was grateful that they uh, started reversing that stuff. And now, you know, now we got... You know, now we get good insurance, and now they have gap insurance that you can buy that actually takes the deductible almost down to zero, basically. So it, it, things have been a lot better over the last three years. So hopefully it stays. Hopefully it stays that way. The good. The good thing is, um, it's a lot easier to sort of trim the fat and 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 burn the excess sort of regulations off than it is to build them up in the first place. Yeah. So it'll take it'll take the Biden administration a long time to even attempt to mess it up as much as uh, it was messed up. So yeah. like Trump unrolled pretty much he took us back to almost like to Reagan slash before Reagan sort of levels of, of, of yeah. regulation overall. But uh the main thing is the time savings and the and the and the various sort of like you said sort of options open up and and you know you offer better things now yeah. ideally we get uh the healthcare system off of the backs of businesses entirely because it unfortunately i think since world war ii or so when they they uh during world war ii they made it so that you could not pay people more than x wage or whatever to work yeah. and so they started incorporating healthcare package benefits as a way to get get around that so it was a, a, a stupid government regulation and businesses trying to get around it which mm. is sort of the, the how the game has been played from the very beginning yeah. um and that unfortunately basically allowed the healthcare industry to slide on top of american labor and american productivity because now every business that wants to operate has to consider those additional costs in there and if you have a system under obama where those costs are dramatically bigger then you're talking about tons of businesses that go out of business entirely or can't even get started up because they just can't afford the the cost people don't understand like so there's basically four metrics that matter in the economy there's cost of living cost of doing business and then there's rep business revenues and personal income and yeah. that that is the game the gap between those two numbers is the name of the game and what trump did one of the brilliant things is by uh increasing the energy supply he brought down the average cost of electricity across the u.s by like two grand a year mm -hmm. for for a regular home people at home, which is 2000 more dollars a year that's going out and becoming consumption or investment and like economic, real economic activity. Um, 
And that was one of the many brilliant sort of aspects of the Trump economy and how he was engineering it and seeing it happen and seeing the surge in the economy and consumption and and um, median household income was the number one marker that just took off under Trump, especially for minority communities and poor communities. He grew the economy for the black community twice as fast as Clinton and four times as fast as Obama. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Uh, and that was just in a few years and, you know, three or four years. So the equivalent is like eight years of Trump equals 40 years of Obama's growth. Yeah. That's the best way to sort of comprehend yeah. the difference. And that's a real lifetime, which means my my grandchild gets this level of income increase versus I do by the time I'm eight years old. Like yeah. that's that's sort of the gap, because by the time you're 40, it's now, you know, your kid's kid that's sort of going to be coming along and really feeling the difference. So yeah. um, it makes a huge difference. And people don't necessarily appreciate appreciate what a what a gap that is. Yeah. So um, you've sort of said that you're kind of concerned with how the country, where the country is headed. Um, I, I think that obviously you're concerned about what's happening, but I, I also think that we're primed. I think people are starting to wake up enough that we're primed to be able to kind of have a course correction. Because uh, people that are American up, resurgence. Yeah, people are people are genuinely upset with what's going on. And uh, now the media will portray it, and they've done a great job of portraying that uh, these minority voices that hate America and, and how awful we are are the majority of Americans, but it's not. Most Americans love the country, and they want to be free, and uh, they're about sick and tired and fed up with the nonsense that's been going on. And I just don't like, and, the, and, I don't like the feeling that the federal government right now says that uh, we are enslaved to them versus them working for us. So I just don't like that feeling. No, no, that's not how it should be at all. Um, yeah, we're, yeah. Um, I sort of lost track of some of what you said there, and I had a point, but it's gone. So we'll just, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll move on from there. Um, so we sort of talked about, so there isn't a not perfectly ideal candidate, but what, what are the components of a good candidate that you sort of look for? What, what types of experience and what types of sort of whatever? What do you look for when you're looking for a good versus a bad candidate? So there was a quote from John Adams. So his son, Quincy, of course, he, later Quincy Adams did, you know, become president, but he wanted to go into public office. And his dad, best advice I think John Adams ever did, gave him. He says, first, go out and be successful in the private sector. And then if you feel the call to go serve your country, then do it. And so that's one of the things I loved about Trump is that he was someone who was boots on the ground, oddly, you know, extremely rich. And for every sense of the word, you would think disconnected, but he really wasn't. He knew what it took to go out and turn a buck and be successful in this world. And I think it gave him that much the competitive edge to be able to go in and be a good president. Second thing I think is he needs someone who is well-versed and loves this country and understands the Constitution and what the founding fathers intended and not look at the Constitution as a living, breathing document that's meant to be interpreted by the, the day we were in, but actually go back and see what the Founding Fathers actually mean and what was their ideas and thoughts, which takes serious study to understand what this country is founded on and, what it, and, and the way they intended it to be led. And then, obviously, I would like someone who is not morally bankrupt, that uh, believes in God, has traditional Judeo-Christian values, um, and that, and and recognizes that this is a const this is a Christian Republic constitution. I mean, that's if you look at the founding fathers, the two things that they pulled from was Jerusalem and religious texts like the Bible, and then they also married it with the Greek, the Greek, the Greek philosophy. So it's it's it was an incredibly inspired feat what they did, and by all yeah. purposes, it shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have been able to happen. But uh, by the grace and miracle of God, it was. Thank goodness for it. And 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 even I'll I'll take it a step further because it's not just drawing from those sources of knowledge; it's the entire last millennia of European history yeah. that they were also sort of aware of and pulling from, and the fall of empires and the faults of man and the trajectory of common law in English, yeah. going from the king ruling all to there being certain rights that are beyond the scope of the king to now the queen being just a figurehead. You know, that was a trajectory that was sort of, 
And so they sort of like looked at the trend and then went, what is its logical conclusion? Let's aim for that sort of ideal. And they encapsulated it very well. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So it's not, so it's, yeah. So they took it that step further. Um, yeah. It was, it was even that much more impressive. It was a millennia of very well-educated, affluent men that were also brave enough to go to war with the British Empire. And don't. And this is the number one thing I like to talk about when it, uh, when it comes to historical context. Before 1776, it was the British colony. Yeah. After 1776, it was when American colonialists fought against the British Empire. And I believe that was the first successful revolt against the British Empire. Um up until that point, India and a bunch of other ones came after, but I think that was the first one. And to me, so it was the nobleman and the king, and the nobleman kicked the king off of the totem pole, but then it was the nobleman and then the substandard, you know, white class, and then the substandard white class to then the black male class, and then the male class to the female class, and then now we're down to transgenders getting their bathroom rights, and like, we've hit a level where citizens are equal under the law, and that was the the primary you know thing and people also don't understand that they were arguing over abolishing slavery at the beginning of the of the country and it was a human institution a, a cross country across the globe yeah. human institution for for thousands of years before that it's not like america invented slavery um no no they did not but uh it was one of the first, bot, like, sort of different races. One is being enslaved. Was it? So there was a white supremacist infusion there, maybe, that wasn't there before. But, um, but that, you know, that's about it. Well, we uh, there was a lot of blood spilt over that. So I think it was one in 18 Americans died. Uh, oh, I think that's the number for the Civil War. So that would be like, you know, whatever, 15 million people now or whatever that would be. So uh, quite a cost to pay for us th for that soon, for sure. Yeah, actually, no, I think it's one in 36. But anyways, there's a lot of people is the point, like a lot of death and a lot of a lot of lives lost. Oh. OK, so we'll wrap it up with this final one. What questions do you have for me, sir? Um, gosh, how old are you? 27, 27. OK, and uh, you live in Stockton, California. Yeah, Stockton, California. Okay. Born, born and raised around Fresno, was in Riverside for a year, Southern California, and then Utah for three years, and now I'm here. So what uh, what made you want to decide to start doing this podcast? Um, it was actually, so I sort of always thought about like, oh, if I was on a podcast, I would want to say this and like whatever. But actually what initiated it, wonderfully enough, was a very small thing. I just saw three different guys on a on a live on Instagram, having really interesting conversation. And two of them I agreed with, but I felt like I could represent their ideas better. And the other guy was playing all sorts of debate tricks and games that I can call out when people try to do them with me. But emotionally, it's difficult for other people who care more about what people think of them. Yeah. Uh, I, I dealt with, you know, uh, I dealt with some embarrassing stuff when I was a kid, like crapping my pants at school in the classroom and yeah. stuff like that. So, somewhere along the way I stopped caring and it, it has its bad sides, but it has its good sides too. I stopped caring about what people thought of me and I cut st mostly stopped caring about stupid opinions. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I, I'm not too concerned with that, but basically I wanted to talk to those guys. And so I just said, I'd like to, you know, interview you or do whatever. And we sort of, it sort of unfolded. And then the term uncommon conversations came into mind and thought it was a good name for a podcast. So it crystallized, couple months ago into that and i've been doing them since and now i'm trying to do three a week but I've, the next couple of weeks i had them and previously i have it double booked on some days today i have another podcast later today yeah. but um it'll be three a week for the most part and it'll be conversations with people i have a whole you've seen on uh, youtube so 2018 yeah. is when i hit a level in my political understanding that made it so that i had unique things to add to the conversation and that is what prompted me to even consider becoming a political person in any way. I was a car detailer up okay. until that point. I just like to listen, plug in my headphones, listen to a lecture seven hours a day, clean cars, you know, something very mindless, but get to feed my mind and keep, you know, my mind active and, and explore interesting things. And I did that for three years. I was a car detailer in Utah, in Orem, at the Hertz car rental place right there on um, 765 South State Street. Uh, okay. right next to 800 South and yeah. State Street. 
Right always- in there. Um, yeah. There's a Maverick across the street that I worked yep. at for a little bit too when I needed some extra money. Um, I was doing 85 hours a week for uh, eight weeks there and basically not sleeping five days a week. That was, yeah. that was a, that was a confidence building, but very difficult time. <laughs> but it, it showed me that like, if I'm in it mentally and I don't break, I can push pretty hard. And that yeah. was really important to learn. Um, anywho, uh, I don't really know why I was going. Oh, um, and so in 2018, I started doing YouTube videos and my, the stuff I had to say was good. And my videos were actually pretty decent upon looking back. I just uploaded some, some of the old ones from, from back in 2018, but I thought it was garbage. And I also knew my ideas were not articulated fully. So I went, looked up a website, got the 50 top topics, everyone debates in politics, wrote them all down and just went and basically went through the full gambit and formulated my ideas on everything. And that became about 150 pages of a, of the ebook I'm trying to, to get across the finish line. It's been, I've been like the last 5% has taken the last year, basically last year and some change. It's been, it's, it was like October of 2019. It's so actually longer than that, almost almost two years now. October of 2019 is where I, I wrote 80 or 90 percent of the book okay. in that month. Um, that's kind of where it all kind of came together. And then I started putting the Uncommon Ground podcast as a policy focused podcast that um, I have a 64 minute video on fixing the economy. That is the best 64 minutes on the Internet when it comes to economic analysis. It's economics 101, how the machine works. It's fixing the tax code from A to Z, every single one, and American economic history and understanding why, since 1970, the lower class has been held back economically by too much immigration too quickly, which increases the supply of labor, bad trade deals, which reduces production, which reduces the demand for labor, the issues with inflation and and the 70s stagflation and just inflation running out. So that dilutes people's labor and their ability to to pay for stuff. and then you have all sorts of other things that I consider the modern systemic racism that just hold poor people back. And at the time they were implemented, black people and brown people were disproportionately poor. So if you have a thing targeted at poverty and then it overlaps in these racial ways, you have this exaggerated single parented effect that we've seen. Number yeah. one, black parent or one, number one single parented rate is in the black community. Net behind that, I believe, is um I think it's the white community or the Hispanic community. They're like very close to each other, but the numbers have gone up since 1970 and it's all proportionate to this poverty level at the beginning. So, um, all that is, all that is. So anyway, so there's a lot in that video is what I'm saying. Yeah. And it's 64 minutes, you know, like to actually with proper detail, explain all that in 64 minutes is pretty badass. Like there's no, no other way of saying it. Um, and so all of those podcasts are like that healthcare, welfare, everything, all of the, and it's the book translated into video form. Um, and so January 6th of 2021, when that happened, uh, at the Capitol lit a fire under my ass that wasn't there before and prompted me to action in a consistent way since then that I haven't had previously. And it's just been a snowball effect where also my mental health through this whole process, I've been able to develop better stabilizing or whatever you want to call it. I've learned how to master my mind over the last three years. And it's this snowball effect where now previously I would have given up on a podcast or maybe even said, I'm done doing them entirely. If I hit a really low point, and that happened, you know, maybe a week and a half, two weeks ago. And I literally just slightly got pulled down into the muck and pulled the nose up out of it and got out of it. And it was like a week of rough mental stuff in the background, but the podcast was still up to standard for me. And like, I was handling everything a lot better. And I'm, and I'm, and this is, I'm in a, I'm hitting a point of snowballing and momentum right now with the mental health stuff. That's really, really helping. So that's sort of where I'm at now. And it's this, this push forward to get the book done, try to create a news agency that, gets down to the local level, every single county, but also goes up to international, you know, levels of coverage. And I have the sort of business plans for that down the road and like laid out. It's all. So I've spent the last 10 years studying politics and thinking a lot. And the next 10 years is 99% execution, basically. 
Well, you. Uh, so that's where I'm at now. I'm at the front end of that that execution period. Well, you're very easy to talk to. So. Well, I, I, that should be good in politics if I'm trying to do this thing. So, <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. I, you know, I, I try to be. I try to be. I, I tried to be from a young age the person that could try to talk to a professor and talk to an inmate, and I literally have done that in the last month. I was on a train going between San Fran and Stockton in the last month and a half, and there was an inmate that just got out of out of prison who I invited onto the podcast, and he had you know found his faith and was and God was sort of leading him to help other people in his position, you know, get out of jail and and help all those kinds of things. And I just had a podcast with a New York University professor about. Yeah. Oh, economics right. and finance so i literally can do that not just want to do that yeah I saw, um, I saw the one with the the professor i watched that one it was good nice nice you like that's good that's good and it was interesting because he really it was the first one where i went fully into the wheelhouse of a specialized of a specialist like that yeah. and, and tried to have a conversation with him because um, it's one thing to think you know what you're talking about. It's another thing to deal with experts and be able to somewhat, you know, and I think I did very well communicate, you know, things. Because I, I, I dropped out of college after the second semester. And like I said, I had all sorts of failings, not for not for intellect reasons, but I had failings in school. So it was not, it's not an obvious thing that I'd be the guy that would, you know, piece all this together. But that sort of works in the grand plan, you know, so to speak. That sort of all works in the theme of the Bible and, you know, the the, the person that you think is the right. And, you know, the person that you want to lead is a person who doesn't want to lead, so to speak, that doesn't care about the, like, if you can recognize the importance of leadership without having an ego or any kind of a power trip related to being a leader, that's like the, the sweet spot. That's yeah. the sweet spot. And I feel like I, I've... Uh, tried to embody and live out that that ethos just because i think it's the right way to go so um I, uh, I used to have a boss and uh he got to sit down and go to lunch with with fred thompson he used to be a senator and he was an actor and, um and uh and he asked him he asked senator thompson at the time says what happens to these guys that go with all these good intentions to 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 go do the right thing and they get there and it just nothing happens. In fact, usually it goes the exact opposite. And Fred Thompson looked at him and says, you have no idea how the power is so seductive that it can take the best of men and corrupt them when they get here. So it's a that power gain and greed thing. It's a, it's a real thing, man. It is a real thing. Get a, and the more, the greater your potential, the greater your potential for good and bad. Yeah. Um, people, you know, Hillary Clinton's a great example of this, in my opinion. Someone who is inarguably brilliant, inarguably, you know, educated and experienced and all this kind of stuff. But to me, that only made her scarier. That did not make her, yeah. like, it did not warm my heart to her. I would, like I said, I, I voted, so I voted third party because I was in California and if you hit 5% on the national level with the third party, they get into the debates the next cycle. Yeah. And so when I found that out, I was like, okay, I'll vote third party. It's the electoral college. It won't matter in California anyways. Um, and we got like two and a half percent or 2.2%. It was pretty good uh, in 2012 okay. is when I first did that. And I did it again in 2016. I think there was less. I think Trump swallowed up some libertarian people. Yeah. Anyways, I would have voted for, I said at the time I would vote for Trump if it was a straight deal, but for this technical reason, I'm not. But I support him over Clinton because he's 5% chance it's really bad, but he's mostly, uh, has more upside than downside. And it was a gamble on something literally, and, and it turned out to be true infinitely and uniquely better than anything we've seen maybe since jfk even better yep. than reagan in my opinion in many I ways agree. i would agree um which is crazy on the yeah. if, if in 2015 you would have thought you would think that now but you know those are five these have been five crazy years or six i should say yeah six sure. crazy years but um yeah. he was a gamble on something good with a tremendous upside and really limited downside because regardless of what they want to say about dictators and stuff um it, it's very difficult to be a dictator in the United States, even with the Patriot Act and all that kind of stuff. Right. Like they're pushing into that territory, this domestic terrorism, Biden situation and the modern Congress I'm worried about. But yeah. it's really hard to actually be a dictator in any real substantive way here in, in the United States. So I wasn't too worried about that. And yeah. with her, 
it was literally just signing off on the same crap sandwich that they've been force feeding us for decades. And I was like, I can't do it. I can't check that mark. I just couldn't do it. So, so I, so I would have voted for him and I did vote for him in 2020. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know what the, what the origins of the grander point of all that was, but there you go. <laughs> no, you answered it. You answered it. So <laughs> that's all I have. That's all the questions I have. All right. All right. And um, I just want to sort of end it here with, with this point. When I was 17 and I started, so I went and got a job collecting signatures for ballot initiatives in California. You know, we have our state ballots and you can get stuff and they'll pay people to go collect signatures. And I saw the people that were the salesmen in that field. A lot of them were alcoholics and really like cynical about the system. And I was like, I don't want to be like that. So I was straightforward about the policies I was talking about when I was doing that back in the day. And if people didn't like them, I wouldn't lie to them about what the legislation was just for the sake of a signature. I was like, I was making 20 bucks plus an hour anyway, sitting there talking politics. It wasn't like I needed that extra 10 bucks an hour to sell my soul, you know? Right. Um, and that gave me the best experience period in terms of developing sort of a, a ground level worldview is most people agree on most things. No one wants a bad economy. No one wants high crime. No one wants cops to be able to abuse citizens and get away with it. Like, yeah. Like, you can make it Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, No Lives Matter, you know, right. you know, whatever. Or you could just say cops shouldn't be allowed to abuse citizens. They serve the public. And if they mess up, they should be held accountable, regardless of whatever blue line brotherhood there might be. It's it's tainting the name of cops if you let bad cops stay there. And bad law enforcement makes bad cops. But most yeah. people agree on most things and the most brilliant people in politics are the everyday people the, that, that like the people that I talked to face to face on, and, and we had a table set up and I'd be like talking with them about the issues. They were some of the people, maybe 5% of them were infinitely more informed on those policies than I was. And I, and, and even than anyone else I was sort of talking to. And it just, it struck me as like, you're smarter and more nuanced and substantive than any politician I've ever heard. Literally, like, and it was like a 30, 40% gap between this everyday person and, and any politician. And I was like, that tripped my mind, man, that tripped my, but it taught me something important that like, that is where they're, the everyday people are smart enough to give them, you know, the proper credit and to say, we don't have to play to the dumbest person with everything we say, make sure you don't say the wrong thing or someone might misinterpret it and, right. you know, all that kind of stuff. We don't have to play those games. We don't have to waste time playing those games. You know, I believe I have faith in the American people, like resoundingly. And um, we can do this is, is basically my, my signature point. It's entirely doable. 50% of people who could vote don't vote. Yeah. So the biggest party in the game are the people that are on the sidelines. So and, and plenty of Republicans, everyday Republicans and 60% of everyday Democrats are totally reasonable. And we can absolutely like make something happen special with them and it's uh, it's partially getting past the oh but you're a a right-wing authoritarian fascist racist you know homophobe whatever like if we can get past that sort of stuff and like i said the race stuff instead of black lives matter white lives matter all lives matter all that crap instead of it just it's about cops being accountable and not being able to abuse citizens if we can get that sort of framing right and everything it's entirely doable like i said it's just a matter of like, execution at this point <laughs> yes, sir. that's the trick <laughs> all right well um that's it this is this has truly been a wonderful conversation thank you so i mean you made me cry you touched my heart with the things you said i really will forever for the rest of my life walk away from this conversation happy that i had it and and better for it so thank you really no. thank you Dude, thank you made my day too so i was uh wonderfully shocked that someone like you would want to interview me so i i really appreciate it it was fun well well but now that you've been interviewed i hope uh, you and everybody else doesn't think that because this was better than i expected and i was expecting good things so yeah <laughs> well thank you you have a great week you have a good one sir god bless you you too <laughs>